Somebody shout amen. amen. I'm going to teach you another one. This is the one I grew up with. I grew up in the black Pentecostal church. This is another one. For those of y'all that have never been to a black Pentecostal church, it's one of the most electrifying experiences you've ever, you've ever been to. Do like this. Make your face like something stinks. And then shake your head like that. Yeah, now I feel like I'm in church. That means, boy, you preaching. Mm, that's good. That's good. Listen, um, how many of you have raised a child? Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. Love you. How many of you guys in this room have raised a child, like a baby, have, by a show of hands? Let me see. All right. You've raised a child. All right. Put your hands down. Of those same people, how many of you that have raised a child have ever dropped your baby? Come on. See some honest people in here. Uh-huh. And the ones that didn't raise your hand up. I'm curious because some of y'all's kids got these knots, the head all funny shaped in the side. Some of y'all young people need to go up to your mom and dad and say, hey, I got this thing right here, mom. Did you ever drop me? The head shape is telling on you. Because one of the biggest fears of a parent is for your child to be dropped. Um, I remember holding my child sometimes in the middle of the night when they would wake up. And, you know, you got the natural cradle position. And when you get sleepy, that whole arm does the slump thing. And I remember catching myself, going, oh, my gosh, I'm going to drop my baby. And I remember when Kennedy was born, it was uh, somewhere like January 2002 after her birth. We had gone to church for the first time. You know, everybody wants to show the new baby. I'm the pastor's kid. We finally had our first. And Kennedy's beautiful. And we took her to church. And my wife and I were very particular. This was pre-COVID, pre-all this weird stuff, but my wife was already on the hand sanitizer game. I mean, she was like, (laughs) now you can touch my baby. Amen. (laughs) Did you wash your hands? Let me see your fingernails. (laughs) Um, And so we were very particular about our child. And she said to a friend, I'm going to speak to the pastors, so don't let anybody Pick up the baby, please, right? So our friend was like, fine. So Adrian goes up to the front. The friend gets distracted, and this very um, pretentious person, I'll say, <laughs> say it like that, goes over to Kennedy and just picks her up out the carrier. And we're looking like, I didn't see it right away. My wife didn't see it right away, but my wife is at the front of the church, and they're at the back of the church. My wife turns around, and she just goes, ah, ah, ah. Put her down, put it, no, put my baby down. I told y'all don't touch my baby, right? You know, there has to be a point in your life where the devil starts touching your things, putting his hands on your life. When you've already said this area of my life, these kids of mine are off limits. Don't touch my child. Satan, keep your hands off them. Keep your hands off my daughter. You cannot infiltrate their mind. And, and you've got to get an eye-eye in your spirit. Some of y'all are so passive with the devil, and he's just running through your life, and you're just like, oh, they'll be okay. No, you have to at some point make a decision that God has given you the responsibility to steward that child, and you have an anointing and a grace on your life to say, no, devil, you can't have them. Somebody say, no, devil, you can't have my children. So next week, we're going to pray for our kids. And we're going to pray for them as they get ready to go back to school. And I would like to anoint them with oil. Anointing Psalm 23 and 5, I believe it is. David said, uh, thou anointest my head with oil. Um, That was the understanding of a shepherd with anointed oil. And Vinny, do me a favor. Can you give me a timer so I can make sure we stop on time? Because I I feel feel like like, like a real good teach on me right now. And we might go somewhere and I don't want to be here too long, you guys. All right? Um. Thou anointest my head with oil. Shepherds would use oil on the sheep because flies would get in their ears. And sheep can't swat them because they have hooves. And so the best they could do was shake, but flies would get inside their ears and, and they would lay nests in their head. And so sheep would get so irritated that they couldn't do anything about it that they would go to rocks and pound their heads to get free from the irritation. But they would anoint the nose of the sheep and the ears of the sheep to keep the flies out. But also the aroma of the oil was a natural repellent for serpents. So we're going to anoint these children 
And we're going to believe that God is going to keep the enemy out of their ears, not allow him to plant seeds in their minds, and keep the serpent away from their lives. Amen? So I want you to bring your kids next week. We want to take that step of anointing them. Speaking of children, one of the most beautiful things of having a child is when a child makes their first steps. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's like first steps are a huge deal because once a child starts to walk, you know, it's a big celebration. I don't know about you, but, man, I remember when Kennedy took her first steps. I was like, yay, first steps are a big thing, but first steps aren't the only firsts that we celebrate. We celebrate first birthdays. We We celebrate the first lost tooth. Come on, somebody got a plastic bag somewhere in your house right now with that 25-year-old tooth from your baby still up in there. Done ride it all. It's probably powder now. We celebrate the first lost tooth, first, first day of school, first picture day, and it keeps going. They keep having firsts, first grade, first boyfriend, first graduation, first child to college. And the celebrations continue because there's always a new first. So it is in the life of a Christian. We have steps. There are steps and firsts. And how many of y'all can remember the first time you felt the presence of God? Like, I can remember like it was yesterday. I could not understand why people were crying, and I just started crying too. And I didn't realize, what, I didn't know what was happening to me, but it was the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember the first time I accepted Jesus into my heart. I remember... The first time I, I got filled literally in dwelling of the Holy Spirit, I remember the first time I spoke in, uh, in a heavenly language. It was the weirdest thing that had ever happened to me because I'm from Ohio, Midwest. As you can hear, I got a little country twang because my dad's from South Carolina. All of a sudden, this thing starts happening to me, and I'm, it's like my mouth starts saying things because they told me what happened. You know, I start saying things. I'm like, wait, this is weird. I don't want that. I'm scared. But it was the most beautiful, freeing thing. First, our beautiful thing to celebrate. And we need to celebrate first. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs 1, verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You ever heard this verse? But fools despise wisdom and instruction. I like it in the message because it says start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. I want to go into this series called Steps because what I see right now, I wish that we had people in this world that had true fear of the Lord. And we do, but I wish we had more. I wish, it seems like the world is looking a little more like the second half of the King James Version of Proverbs 1, 7, instead of the first half. It said, fools despise wisdom and knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and knowledge. And when I look, around, when I look at the world, what I see is a bunch of fools. And no, nobody believes the truth anymore. Truth is so subjective. Everybody has their own version of truth. There is no standard. There's no absolute truth anymore. And I don't know what you believe in this room, but I want you to know what we believe in this room. We believe that there is an absolute truth, and it is found in the scriptures of God, in the Bible that we read in those 66 books, and he reveals them to us by his spirit. Now, I hope, you are on that same page. If not, I hope you get on that page. And if you don't want to get on that page, I'm going to pray and help you find a place where you can believe there is no absolute truth. Bernie Mac, I ain't scared of y'all up in here. <laughs> I really want you to come to the knowledge of the truth. Because there's no way that you can lead your life and accomplish everything that God has for you. I'm not talking about some of the things. I don't want to just hit and miss and hit and miss. And I want everything that God has for me, and I want you to have everything that God has for you. So I want to teach for the next four weeks this series called Steps. And it starts with this question. Does God know me? Does God know me? And I know if you're like me, you're a thinking person. Of course God knows me. He knows everything. If God knows everything, then he knows me. But I want to dig a little deeper into that question because there's, a, there's an answer that I think we find in the scriptures. There's some tension about that question. But first, do me a favor. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Lord, I'm not satisfied to just proclaim that I know you. But I want to know for sure that you know me. I want to be fully known by you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I believe it is possible to know who someone is, but not know them. Everybody can, you know who I am, right? But just knowing who I am doesn't mean you know me. You don't know what my favorite color is. You don't know what gets me excited. You don't know what frustrates me. You don't know what my favorite food, well, y'all know my favorite food is fried chicken. I talk about it all the time. When I get to heaven, my, my mansion's going to have chicken everywhere. It's going to be thighs and over there and the legs over there and breast meat and wings. And... The patron bird of heaven for Aaron Lindsay is a chicken, okay? <laughs> but you don't know me, and I don't know you. And it's funny because I see people in the community, and I'm like, I think I know them, but I don't know them. And I've had friends around me that have said they know people, but you find out folks don't know who they say they know. Because when that folk they say they know come around, that folk they said they know doesn't know them. <laughs> if I got to say, you, I think I know you from somewhere, then I don't know you. I haven't spent time with you. We haven't had a chance to sit down and get close. I, I don't know you. I don't know you. I got this story that my wife told me, um, she reminded me of. I got these whole lot of stories, but this one I've forgotten, she reminded me of it. I was at an event, and you guys know I do music for a living. I was a producer for a long time, and And uh, there was this young man that was talking to a group of friends of mine, and he was telling them his bio. He was running it down. Yeah, man, I've done this, I've done that. You know, he's doing his thing. That thing musicians do when they're around other musicians or business people when they're around other business people and want to impress them about what they're doing. So he just started talking about his gigs and the things that he's done and running it down, man, and he's just sounding impressive. And my buddies were over there, and they had this look, and they brought me over, and I come over, and they're like, hey, tell tell them what, what you Say that again. <laughs> They're like, I want you to meet this guy. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. He said, uh, tell us what you've done. He says, yeah, man, I'm, I'm a producer. I do, I do tracks. I play keys. I do this and that. And then they were like, who you work with? He was like, oh, yeah, I work with this person, that person. He said, I work with Aaron Lindsay. And I was like, I said, really? You work with Aaron, you work with Aaron Lindsay? What did, so tell me, so what, what did you work on with him? Like, what, what did y'all do? Oh, man, it was like some, some kind of indie thing. What, what indie thing? Um, it's just, you know, just, you know he's, now he's trying to find a way to explain. And I'm like, oh, cool. What, what, are you, what did you do on the project? Oh, some programming and stuff like that. that was just, I, at some point, I had to let him off the hook because it's getting worse and worse. I said, man, I just want you to know I, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Aaron Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the days before Instagram where all you had was the back of an album cover. And a name. You couldn't always track a face. I didn't have a website. This was back in the day. So he didn't know he was standing there talking to Aaron Lindsay <laughs> and saying he had work with Aaron Lindsay. And it's so sad, but so common that people talk about God. And they talk about how they know God. But they really don't have a relationship with God. And so the question is, it's possible to know who God is, but for God to not really know you. So let me put you in the Bible, because I know some of y'all scratching your head like, that sounds different than what I've heard so long. You know, and I understand why people are frustrated with the difference that you hear when I say something like that, because often we leave out parts of the Bible as preachers that give the world an image of Jesus that's not in consistency with the Jesus of the Bible. So people get mad at Jesus when they encounter Jesus because he convicts them of sin. He asks them to do things and say, sacrifice, don't be a jerk, don't be mean. Well, the preacher said, I can just do whatever I want to, and I, you love me anyway. This ain't about love, this is about knowing. Matthew 7, I'm sorry, y'all, I just got to preach the gospel. Because... When we finish this sermon today, there's going to be some people in this room that go, I'm not sure if he knows me. I'm going to make sure before I leave this room that I answer that question clearly with a resounding, confident, hands raised, yes, he knows me. And I know him. He's my Savior. Not just my Savior, he's my Lord. He's in charge. And he's not just in charge, he's my friend. He's the lover of my soul. He made me new. You're going to leave in that condition, and you're not going to go to bed at night wondering, if I don't wake up, where am I going to be? 
Matthew 7, 21 gives us some tension here. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, Lord is that kind of way Jesus said to Martha, Martha, Martha. It indicates y'all have a relationship. Adrian, Adrian. You know, if you see one of your homies out there, Bill, Bill, hey, yo, it's me. Lisa, Lisa, hey, it's me. But Jesus said, not everyone who calls up to me, they use the right name, right? They said, Lord, Lord, we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually, what's that word there? Didn't say that, know the will. Ooh. This is that stuff that I'm cracking my knuckles because I'm nervous too. When I read that, I'm like, yikes. I thought I could just know the will of God and and give a little offering and show up on Sunday and go back on Monday and then come back Sunday and do it again. And that would pay for my week, you know. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Next verse. This is the, let me be clear, this is not a person in the Bible writing. This is Jesus' words, okay? This is somebody's opinion. This is Jesus' words being being written. On Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. And we cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. This sounds like church people. They don't sound like folks that just came out the club. They were prophesying and casting out demons and performing miracles in Jesus' name. These are church people now. It, doesn't that make you a little bit concerned? Like, hey, what is happening here? This is what Jesus said, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. Oh, my gosh. This is the tension that Jesus was trying to communicate, that it is possible for you to know who I am. They knew what name to drop. Do you remember the story of Moses when he went still before Pharaoh and said, let my people go? And they brought out all these prophets of Baal, and, uh, or, or the story of Elijah, when he stood in front of the prophets of Baal, and they were doing all these miracles. And over and over in the Scripture, you see... That just because people can work miracles, it doesn't mean that God is the one working the miracle through them. You know how people, it said we prophesied in your name, and he didn't know them. It's not, I'm not impressed with prophetic, because that just means you have a gift. I'm impressed with the character of your life. The fruit of the, is the fruit of the Spirit coming out of you. When I taste your life, do I taste fruit? This is what Jesus was saying. He didn't say, I never knew you like I don't know who you are. He was saying, I don't recognize you as my disciple. I don't recognize you as my disciple. Yeah, I know who you are. And yeah, you knew what to do and you knew what name. You know what using me does. But you don't know what walking with me is. Come here, Judas. Come here, Judas. Judas. Come over here, Judas. For three years, Judas... Now, I'm not talking to a real person. I'm in my mind. I'm in the Bible, and I'm going to that verse of scripture. Come here, Judas. Come here. Everybody's like, "Is he coming?" <laughs> <laughs> I ain't talking about you, Carlos. <laughs> in my mind, I see Judas walking with Jesus for three years. Three years, miracle after miracle, sign after sign, sermon after sermon. Judas is right there with Jesus. He's one of the disciples. He's a named disciple. Three years, he's got a relationship, experience with Jesus. He's there all the time. But at the end, Judas was disconnected from Jesus. He killed himself. Why? Because he was never there before. because of the relationship. He was there because of the money. He chose the benefits of using the name of Jesus as opposed to the relationship with Jesus. And at the end, he could not bring himself to repent. He couldn't bring himself to repent and rebuild his relationship with Jesus. So he was disqualified, although he was a disciple. That's tension, y'all. I don't want to stand before God and say, I preach that believe LA. Lord, I even talked about Matthew 7 when you were going to do this to people. And, and, and I did all this in your name. I don't want them to look at me and, be say, and say, I never knew you. Get away from me. Because you are breaking God's laws. 
Let's talk about this word new and no and no and new because that's, you know, no can be kind of confusing. In the Old Testament, this word is used interchangeably with the word chosen. I know you. I choose you. I have chosen you. Um, let me give you some scriptures that, con- uh, that give you context for that. It means I recognize you as mine. Oh, my God, don't you want to be recognized as his to him? I want Jesus to look at me and say, man, I recognize you as mine. You belong to me, and I am yours, and you are my. Listen, you belong to me. I want to be recognized as a disciple. Amos 3 and 2 says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. He's talking about the children of Israel, which means you only have I chosen. He has chosen the children of Israel to be his children. Genesis 18, 18, and 19, he talks about Abraham. He says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord. What he, what he was saying is, I've chosen him. I want you to know, everyone in this room, are you ready for some good news? Because I've been giving y'all bad news. Somebody say yes so I can get off the bad news, please. Who say yes, I'm ready? <laughs> okay, thank you, because I need to get off of it too, right? I want to be known. 1 Corinthians 8 and 3 in the NIV says, but whoever loves God is known by God. Let me ask you, is there anybody in this room that can say, I love God? Do you love God? What's wrong with you? (laughs) I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you? That's a song for those of you that are wondering why I'm so ratchet all of a sudden. No, it is not Megan, the stallion. That is Erica. Um, Anyway, whoever loves God is known by God. That's good news. Galatians 4 and 9 says, so now that you know God, oh, wait. Or should I say now that God knows you? Here's the criteria. Why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? That says, now that God knows you, why are you going back? That means there's an option. You can stay known or you can be unknown. How many want to stay in the known category? I want to be known, so I'm not going to go back and become slaves again. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, you are a chosen generation. I promise you right now. The difference maker right now is that you understand that you are chosen. Once you know you're chosen, it changes the way you walk. It changes the way you think about yourself. It changes your attitude about your own life. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't have to fear or feel afraid because you know you are a chosen generation. God chose you before the foundations of the world. Now, my role and responsibility is to say, I am chosen by God, and I want to walk in his principles. I want to live with a relationship with him. How can we do this? We have to build our own relationship with God. We have to build our own relationship with God. I was at Walmart. Y'all pray for me. I done got the golf bug. I'm out there. You know, I love love it now. I mean, I'm too old to play basketball, lower back issues. I don't like running that much. Can't play football. Don't like it like that. Um, golf is the one for me. Nice, easy, grass, driving. You know, hey, that's cool. It's a cool sport, right? And uh, God, y'all pray for me because I've introduced my sons to golf. And anybody that knows golf knows golf is expensive. It's not cheap to play golf. And so my sons and I were going to Walmart to get some shirts. And um, I'm not that good at golf. Brad knows that. Um, but... I enjoy it, and I took my sons, and we went to get some golf shirts because, you know, you can't just show up at the golf course with sweats on. There's rules to this thing. You can't show up in there looking with a hoodie on and say, I'm just going to play around. No, there's a dress code. There's a way we do this. So we're in Walmart, me, Blake, and Aaron. Aaron's on this side, Blake's on that side, and we're walking, and there's this young man coming toward me and his mother, and I'm just like, they're smiling at me. I'm smiling at them. I'm like, I bet they know me, probably from the church. You know how we do it. We think everything is about me, you know. So I'm just walking in, and I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. I got to wait. Let me get it together, right? So I go to speak to the young man, and he daps with me. And then quick, before I even got to say how you, he's like, what's up, Aaron? Hey! And they're like embracing and hugging. And, and immediately I realized he didn't know me. He knew Aaron Lindsay, but he knew this Aaron Lindsay, the second. He didn't know me. 
He had recognized me. I, I kind of recognized him too. I knew him from somewhere. Couldn't put it together though. But I thought I knew him. But I didn't know him. He knew my son. So I didn't know him. I, I thought I knew him, and he looked familiar to me. So when I got to him, I was ready for the whole, hey. And he was like, hey, way. Well, man, what's, what's good? And his mom just stood there all like, I don't know you, sir. <laughs> don't try to get it over here either. He knew my son. Sometimes we think because my mama prayed for me, or because I have a Bible study group, and, or because my friends know God, or because my dad was a pastor, or I was raised in the church. Whatever reason you want to give yourself, because you think you have proximity to Jesus, that you know Jesus. Being around somebody doesn't indicate a relationship. I knew this kid because I would see him when I would pick my son up at school, so I knew who he was. I knew who he was, but I didn't know him. He didn't know me. I don't want to be in a situation with Jesus where I'm like, well, I'm in proximity to people that know you, so I think, I think you ought to know me. You have to build your own relationship with God. You have to take responsibility for your life and say, God, this, this is on me right now. This is, I'm not going to, it's not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. This is on me, God, and I want to build a real relationship with you. The people in Matthew 7 were not unbelievers. Doesn't even say they were false prophets. It just said Jesus didn't know them. Homie, we don't know each other. I don't know you. We never spent time together. Many of us only call on God under stress. When there's pressure, when there's problems going on. Catfish coming, Jesus. Help me stay fresh. But we missed a greater opportunity to build a relationship. And those of you who are wondering, what is a catfish? Not the catfish on the Internet. It's a message. If you go to YouTube, we're talking about catfish and codfish. Anyway, moving on. Build your own relationship with God. It is beautiful. <laughs> the ADD is kicking in. It's beautiful to choose to know someone out of love instead of obligation. Wouldn't you hate to be the person that has to be loved? Just because you don't want to take care of everything, you got to love me. I want you to choose to love me. Today, God has given us a choice, and he's not looking for people that know him based on rote, that read the Bible as a history book. He's looking for people that genuinely love him, and not just love him, but are willing to live a life where they stop doing what's wrong. That's a novel concept. That's a novel concept. Jesus wants you to stop doing wrong. We don't talk like that in church no more. (laughs) Jesus wants you to stop doing what's wrong. How many parents want your kids to keep doing wrong? Oh, son, just, boy, you do wrong better than anybody I know. (laughs) Keep the party going. Here's $100. Keep doing wrong. No. We're like, stop doing wrong. Because the better you are at not doing wrong, the better your life will be. God is saying, I don't want you to live your life doing wrong. And I know that's very simple, but it's from the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.19 in the Living Bible says, but God's truth stands firm like a great rock. God's truth stands firm like a great rock. And guess what? This is God's truth. We already talked about people don't believe there's truth. But God's truth stands so firm that nothing can shake it. Nothing can shake it. It is a foundation stone with these words written on it. Check this out. This is still good news. The Lord knows those who are really his. That's on the top line. And this is what's on the bottom line. And a person who calls himself a Christian should not be doing things that are wrong. Oh, my gosh. That is so good because it demystifies what it is to be known by God. Oh, man, he knows I'm really his. And Hey, a person that calls himself a Christian should should not be doing things that are wrong. That ain't hard. If you're going to train for a sport, you have to change your diet. And nobody sees it as punishment. Because the joy is I get better at what I'm training for. If I sacrifice here, I get better at what I'm training for. We are not training for earth. 
We're not trading for here. There's a day coming when God will resurrect us and we will be with Him. We're not trading for this place. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. You and I, if God tarries, will die. And we're going to live somewhere else. And the Lord knows those that are really His. And when you stand before God, He's going to know that you're really His. He's going to look at you and say, Hey man, Yankee cat, what up baby? Come on in, let's go. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what I want. That's not just what I want for me, that's what I want for you. The only thing is, a person that calls himself a Christian should just not be doing things that are wrong. It's, it's cool. Just don't do things that are wrong. That's how to make it easy for you. So, Pastor, what are the steps? I'm talking about all these steps. You ready? This is, this is going to be a hard one, all right? So, pull your phone out. It's got a lot of writing. Just bear with me. I got 13 minutes, and we'll be done in an hour. Uh, <laughs> kidding. Um, ready? Here's the steps. I'm going to say them all at once. Believe. Got it? That's it. That's the step. That's it. Believe. 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 Every other religion has a bunch of steps. You have to do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, 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 and then you'll see you'll receive salvation. The things that we do, like baptism, the sacrament, and communion, and fasting, and discipline, and prayer, and all that stuff, those are parts of our life as a believer. But those aren't the steps. The step is believe. Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Acts 16, 30 through 31. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Now, here's the, here's the catch. When you read that, you go, oh, if I believe, I'll be saved, and everybody in my house will be saved. That's not what he's saying. If you believe, I sound like Kevin Hart. <laughs> Careful. Yikes. <laughs> this is not a Netflix special. <laughs> it's not if I believe and I receive Jesus that my whole house will be saved. It means if I believe in the Lord Jesus, I will be saved. Then guess what? That goes for everyone else in your household too. Everyone else has that same opportunity. Guess what? Mom, dad, those of you that have children that you've been nervous and like biting your nails, like are they going to make it? Are they going to be saved? Are, are they going to ever receive Jesus? Teach them that it's not as hard as they think. This is the easiest deal ever. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. That ought to be good news for somebody because you've got a list in your mind, and you've said, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, I haven't done this, I don't qualify, I'm not saved enough, I'm not righteous enough, I'm not godly enough, I haven't done enough, I have proven enough, I haven't given enough, and God is saying, believe! Religion says, do all these things, and those things are not wrong, but this is the part of salvation that matters. You must believe because when you believe, you live in accordance to what you believe. People say they believe in Jesus, but they don't live like they believe in Jesus. They say they believe in Jesus, but they don't live like they believe in Jesus. They live like they believe he can't save them. They live like they believe he's not enough. They live like they prefer the law over his grace. They live like they don't think the blood is good enough. Believe, L.A. Believe, L.A. Believe, L.A. Believe, L.A. Believe, L.A. That's why that's the name of this church. What must we do to work the works of God is what this, they asked Jesus. And he said, your work is to believe on the one that he sent. Oh, my gosh. You're telling me if I just believe on the one that God sent, I can do the things God created for me to do? Yes, you can. But first, you've got to believe you are a sinner that needs salvation. If you think you got it already, then hey, what are you believing in? You're believing in yourself. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. 
You know, I remember watching some guys playing basketball from a distance, and dude was dunking like he was Air Jordan dunking sideways. I'm like, man, that dude must have been in the NBA. I mean, he was just flying. Boom! I was like, yo, he's not that tall to be getting that high. Like that's, I mean, I know that might be like judgy or whatever, but sorry to folks that are vertically challenged. I, he was just going, what, he's bang, just dunking and throwing it up. It bounces, he catches it, boom! I'm like, yo, this guy's amazing. But then when I got closer, guess what? He had lowered the standard. <laughs> the goal was short. Of course you could do all that when you drop the standard. Of course you could do all that when you drop the goal. Of course you can fly through the air when you drop the goal. But it was supposed to be played at 10 feet. Can you do it at 10 feet? Probably not. You, but you need help. You need help to do it at 10 feet. Some of us do. Some of us don't. But, but most of us need help to do it at 10 feet. And here's the challenge. We, God was trying to show us that you can't reach this standard by yourself. You can't reach this. That's why the law was there. That's why they had all those laws. I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about the law of Moses. Like, you've got to make this sacrifice. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Because Jesus said, if you believe in me, you won't need all those things. You just, I am the fulfillment of the law. You don't need all that stuff. Just believe in me. And guess what? You'll be flying, and you'll be able to meet the standard because you won't be doing it on your own strength. I will empower you to do it. Holy Spirit doesn't make the Christian life better. It makes the Christian life possible. You can't do it without him. We have this image in our minds that I was living my life and doing my thing and, you know, in my boat of life. I go to college, get my degree, get a job, find me a boat thing, and we all in the sea of life, enjoying life, doing our thing. A storm comes up, and all of a sudden, capsize. Oh, now I'm drowning. And Jesus comes walking on the water, and he picks us up, and he saves us. Let me tell you something. The Bible doesn't describe the sin condition like that. According to the scriptures, you weren't drowning. You were dead. We weren't drowning. We were dead. Colossians 2 and 13 says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. You were literally dead. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He didn't just come back to life. He brought us back to life. When Jesus was resurrected, he gave us the power to be resurrected. We were all dead in our sins. And here's the challenge. Sin seems easy, but it's really a job. Because according to Romans 6.23, it's the only one that has wages. It's the only one that has a check. The problem is the check is death. <laughs> Y'all like, oh, never thought of it like that. The wages of sin is death. That's a job. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If I come over your house and I bring you a gift and it's beautifully wrapped, I mean bows, glitter, spray paint, ornaments, and I give it to you. Brother, I brought this gift for you. And you open that gift, and inside of it is your favorite thing, whatever that thing is, right? Some of y'all might be a watch. Let's, let's say it's a really expensive watch. Are you a watch guy? Kind of? No, 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 he doesn't understand. All right. Anybody a watch person in here? If I bring you a gift, and it's got this expensive watch in it, and you open it, and it's your favorite, you're going to go, thank you, man. Oh, this is cool. How would you feel if I pulled it went in my pocket and said, all right, would, you like, would that be cash or check or you want to get, hit me up with the cash app? <laughs> right? It's not a gift then, right? It's something that you had, to, you had to pay for. That's how the devil gives us sin. He wraps it as a gift, but he gives us a bill. And it always comes with more interest than you expect. But the free gift of God is eternal life 
through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because salvation is a gift to receive, not a goal to achieve. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's a gift. And some of you in this room are like, man, I misunderstood this thing. I didn't know. I thought I had to like work, 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 work and earn it. No, in most cases, when you're working, 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 working like that, it's, that be, it's because you have this mentality that it's not free. That Jesus didn't pay at all. That you got a receipt that you got to pay for. No, listen, the only thing you got to do is give him everything. That's the only catch. It just requires total surrender. It's free, but you just got to give him everything. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? But to give God everything is, is easier than it sounds. It's not a work thing. I've got to give him everything. No, I just have to receive. I have to rest in what he's done. And then guess what? Stop doing what's wrong. Man, it almost feels weird with that coming out of my mouth. Because we don't talk about living right in church. And that's, that's weird. We're in church, but we don't talk about living right. But how many know we want to be different? I'm so sick of, I'm so sick of that narrative about the church being filled with hypocrites and people that don't do right and people that don't believe the word. I want Believe LA to be a place where folks go, man, those people are real. They believe it and the fruit is in their life. And when I became a part of that church, my life changed forever. Because I realized it wasn't as hard as I thought. All I had to do was receive it. And there's some of you in this room that never received Jesus. You can already tell by how soft my voice is. I'm getting ready to give you an opportunity. I've been yelling all this time to get you to this point. <laughs> You're like, oh, he's got that tone. I bet somebody's going to come on the piano in a minute. And, and they are. This is your moment. <laughs> this is your moment. This is your moment. This is your moment to receive Jesus. If you never received Jesus in your life, You've never accepted him truly, according to how I, I explained it there. If, you, if you're not sure that you are known by God, I want everybody to bow your heads. I'm going to pray with you. We're going to do what Romans 10 and 9 said. We're just going to confess and believe. We're going to confess with our mouth and believe with our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead and we will be saved. I'm just going to lead you through it. Some of you all have never prayed this prayer before. So I don't expect you to be able to do it on your own. So I'm going to lead you. I just want you to repeat after me. This is... The way we give our confidence to Jesus that he can handle our lives. And this is the way, like I said, first step for a child is the first step. Then there's another first step. And then there's another first step. They're always new. But I want to give you the opportunity to get in on what God has already given you. Repeat this after me. Say, Dear Lord, I come to you now admitting that I need saving. I repent of my sins. And everything I've done wrong. I'm so sorry. But I receive you now. I believe you died. I believe you rose. And I believe you have all power. I receive your forgiveness. I ask you to be Lord of my life. I ask you to be Lord of my life. For the rest of my life. I believe I'm saved. And I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Salvation is a gift to receive, not a goal to achieve. I don't want you to.